The multi-perspectivity dilemma. Who do you give voice to? Multi-perspectivity means allowing for pluralism and preventing a single perspective from dominating the conversation. Sometimes this freedom can lead to forgotten or silenced voices to be heard. Sometimes these voices advocate for extreme, perhaps uncomfortable views. So how do you strike a balance between letting all voices be heard and not facilitating the spread of hate or radicalism? This video will not necessarily provide an answer to this question, as the solution to this problem is always found on a case-by-case -case basis. So instead, this video aims to provide global examples of this persistent issue to inspire reflection and dialogue about potential solutions. We will speak specifically about commemorations. Let's start with Japan. The suffering of hundreds of thousands of comfort women as sexual slaves of the Imperial Army of Japan was rarely acknowledged after the war and is still denied by apologists in Japan. Most of these women were seized from Korea, and thousands of others were abducted from Malaysia, Thailand, and Indonesia. The memorial to the thousands of comfort women enslaved by the Japanese army is an important symbol of commemoration against the grain of history. The campaign to remember these women and acknowledge the crimes committed against them has been opposed by Japanese nationalists and Japan's government. Let's move on to the Baltics. Estonia was independent from 1919 until 1940, when it was re-annexed by the USSR and then put under Nazi occupation. Though the Baltic states were liberated by the Red Army, they were not allowed to regain independence. They were reintegrated into the USSR. The so-called Forest Brothers were partisans who fought a long guerrilla war against the Soviets. They were vilified and forgotten until 1990, when they became heroes of the nation after the independence of the Baltic states. The memorial to the Forest Brothers in Estonia and the Baltic states could never have been placed there until the collapse of communism and the recovery of independence. Volhynia province has been part of Western Ukraine since the end of the Second World War. Before the war, however, it was part of Poland. In 1943 and 1944, many of the Poles living in Volhynia were driven out or killed by the Ukrainian insurgent army, called the UPA. After 1945, the whole region was under Soviet domination. The USSR enforced a large-scale population exchange that moved the borders of Ukraine far to the west. After the collapse of the USSR in 1991, what happened in Volhynia became once again an issue of controversy and conflicting nationalisms. In Ukraine, memorials appeared in memory of Poles who suffered ethnic cleansing from the Ukrainian National Army, the UPA. They were matched by memorials to the patriotic heroes who had fought for the UPA. For many people, the end of World War II did not mean a heroic, glorious victory. It caused bitter resentment or angry defiance of defeat. After 1945, so-called outsiders in Germany, Italy, and Japan wanted a different narrative from defeat, shame, the humiliation of foreign occupation, and economic collapse. After the end of the USSR in 1990 and 1991, similar feelings were expressed by so-called outsiders in East Central Europe. Sometimes these national feelings could be extreme. After 1945, many Germans resented the shame of defeat. And sometimes this was merely controversial, remembering old comrades reasserting national pride and Christian values. Sometimes it was a complete denial that war crimes, even the Holocaust, ever happened. The HIAG, the Mutual Aid Society for Former Members of the Waffen-SS, was founded in Bonn in 1951 as a pressure group with the aim of gaining rehabilitation for soldiers who had served in the Waffen-SS as patriots and not as war criminals. Its first leader was Paul Hausa, a former SS general. HIAG owned a publishing house, producing many books and a monthly magazine, Der Freiwillige, Free Will. It was finally banned in 1992, following the re reunification of Germany. The ceremonies attended by the followers of the German Hayag show a similar desire to rehabilitate forgotten German soldiers in the SS as patriots and not war criminals. David Irving is an anti-establishment British historian who caused controversy throughout his career by challenging liberal democratic interpretations of Hitler's Germany. Irving produced many books that can be defended as legitimate works of history even though they put forward provocative views. But he also joined with right-wing extremists in denying the Holocaust. In 1996, 
Irving sued Penguin Books for libel, attacking an American historian, Deborah Lipstadt, who had accused him of Holocaust denial. In 2005, Irving was arrested in Austria and charged with Holocaust denial. He was found guilty and served 13 months in jail. Dinko Shakic was a convicted war criminal. He was commandant of Jasenovac concentration camp run by the Croatian fascist movement, the Ustasha, led by Ante Pavlic. The Ustasha murdered many Jews, Roma, and Serbs during World War II, and many died at Jasenovac. Shakic escaped to Argentina in 1945 and lived there until 1999 when he was handed over to be tried for war crimes. He was sentenced to 20 years in prison, but right-wing Croatian nationalists continued to regard Shakic and Ante Pavlic as heroes of the nation and the Catholic faith. When Shakic died in 2008, he was given a funeral mass with full Catholic honors led by Father Vyacheslav Lasic, attended by 300 people. To conclude, the struggle for recognition by forgotten voices can be inspirational and affirmative. It can also lead to the renewal of old hostilities, even to a competition between groups arguing, my grievance is more important than yours. Perhaps the best commemoration is truly inclusive. The local cemetery at Lambsdorff Lebanovitsa may be some sort of guide. The village in Upper Silesia was once part of Germany, but now is a part of Poland. The graves in the cemetery hold French POWs from 1870, British, French, Romanian, and Serb POWs from World War I, British, French, Polish, and Soviet POWs from World War II, along with many Germans. Peaceful, quiet, and off the beaten track, it commemorates all buried there as equals. So, what can be learned from these examples? Some people may consider the memorials to comfort women as insulting to Japan, or the memorial of the Forest Brothers as insulting to Russia. Others will consider it a necessary statement to make as a response to past injustice. The argument sometimes lies with debating the historical truth, but more often it lies in its interpretation, which is always subjective. We hope that you have found food for thought in our presentation, and we invite you to share your thoughts with us in the comments section below.